when you have that one done. Um, we're not going to do that one today because it's a little harder to clean out. It's a lot easier to have somebody clean their arm than it is their foot in this class. So what I would like you guys to do is when you have somebody um, performing this test, you want to make sure that they are clean going in and then you would always clean this afterwards. In this one you can see, if you look through here, there's this little plastic piece on the inside. That is where your patient is going to stop when they insert their arm into this measuring device. Um, you're going to go down to the point where their hand hits that. So their thumb is going to be on one side, fingers on the other. That way you have a controlled place for the patient to stop and you know that you're always getting a consistent reading when you do it the next time. Um, so to initiate this, what we have to do, uh, and I'm going to have you just go kind of wash your arm. <laughs> so when you set this up, I pre-filled it just so that we're almost to the point where we need it to, to start. But to have a consistent place to start, you're going to fill this until you get just a little bit of overlap. And we're going to let that run out. Once it's done running out, then we know that we are at the spot where we can um, reproduce that. So the next time you start it, you're going to be at that exact level, and it's when the water stops running out. So now we know that the same volume of water is in there each time you start, okay? So I'm going to let that drip a little. So I mean, it's a little bit of a lengthy process. Okay. Make sure that you have a towel with you. Okay. It's almost done. When you have your patient put their hand into the device, you are going to have them go slowly because you are going to need to fill up the, um, I hope I don't need more than one, <laughs> but um, you're going to fill this up and then this is what you're going to use to measure the volume of water that was displaced. So I'm going to have you come up. You are going to, so you're going to tell your patient, I'm going to have you slowly stick your hand in and you see where that rod is. That is going to go right here. So as you go down, you're going to slowly insert your hand into that. And so as she's doing that, you can see there's water that is displacing from there. And push down until it ends. There you go. And we're again going to let this run until it stops dribbling. Okay, so now with that, this is how much water was displaced with her hand being in there. You can imagine if somebody had more swelling, well, how much would there be more or less water? More, no. water. more water, so you're getting a really consistent reading on how much water is being displaced. All right, so I'm just gonna come out and let you dry your hand. So, oops, sorry. Okay, so now comes the accurate measuring. So you're going to go to a flat level this is in milliliters, and of course, this is five, I can't read this on my glasses, but this is 500 milliliters. So you're going to fill this up, and we'll probably get past 500, maybe. No. 456. No, 455. <laughs> 460 milliliters. So she's not quite 500. So you are going to record volumetric uh, measurements of the right upper extremity. <laughs> then you will measure, or you will write next to that 460 milliliters. So that is how you do that test. It doesn't take forever, um, but definitely an accurate test if you're looking for somebody to um, either ankle or hand wrist. It's a great way to measure that. Uh, you would be either comparing to the other side, so like somebody who had a wrist or hand injury, you'd be comparing to the normal side. If you have somebody who has bilateral lower extremity, you're looking for decreases as you, um, over time, because you wouldn't necessarily have a normal to go by. But if you had somebody who had an ankle sprain or an ankle injury, this is also a great way to compare both sides. Different 
Different one. Yeah, there's one. There's a, another one that has a foot that doesn't have the little bar in there. And for the one that has a foot, you have the person start in standing or in sitting. I'm standing, but in sitting, you lay again until their foot hits the ground and their heel and their front, the whole foot has to be flat. Okay. Make sense? Any other questions with this? If you wanted to just use that being the practical, um, would you have to do both? Like an affected and unaffected? Well, so typically we would probably say, okay, the affected side is, or the unaffected side is, and we'll be able to. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So definitely an alternative for you. All right. Now, if your tester were to say, well, that's a really great test. Is there something else you could do? Um, just have a backup. But if not, if you say, well, no, that's really the gold standard for this type of injury, um, then we'll have you do it. Okay. All right. So that is how you do that test. Okay. Now I need somebody who has an ankle that I can use. We'll do figure eight. <laughs> Did you just hit me? Um, no. Maybe. All right, Nicole, any volunteers? Aubrey's doing Okay. I don't want to look at Aubrey's ankle. So, figure eight. The biggest thing with figure eight is that you are consistent. Uh, let's have you just sit at the edge with your foot over the edge. So the biggest thing for the, you can actually scoot back so that just your oh, ankles, okay. yeah. there you go. Okay, so for the figure eight, again, the biggest thing is consistency. So that's why you want to practice it. There are different, there are different ways that you can do it, but you want to make sure that A, you are being consistent and that you are not double backing someplace that you've already measured. So for this, we typically do this in centimeters <coughs> because it's a little more accurate, not accurate, but it's easier to get a, a more accurate reading. I typically start now, this too could be a little different. Dr. Holliston might start at lateral malleoli, I start at medial, but I'm consistent in how I do it every single time. So if you search figure eight measurement, you will probably get four different ways to do it. Actually, I think she starts up here, but I typically start medial malleolus. I make sure that my um, zero is right in the center of that. I go back to posteriorly to lateral malleolus. And I always try to make sure that I'm holding on to it so it doesn't slip. And I come across to navicular, over to the fifth med, met head. Make sure I get on it. And when you do this, you want to make sure that you're not pulling it super tight. You're laying it on the skin, and that's how you make sure you have a consistent reading. Ooh, did I just let go of that one? Hard to talk and do this at the same time. And then I come back around to where I started, and for her, she was at 52.2. So 52.2 centimeters, I would then look at the other side and see if that is the same as the other side. Yeah. Can you go over the landmarks one more time? So it's medial malleolus, posterior onto the lateral, mm -hmm. lateral malleolus. Down to navicular. Medial to the navicular, and then. Fifth med head, fifth metatarsal head and then come back across. Now, I believe Dr. Huddleston starts somewhere in the middle. Um, so when you look at the video, you might see a different way to do it. All I care about is that you are consistent. You can do it Dr. Huddleston's way. You can do it another way on the internet that you see. The biggest thing is that you are consistent, okay? So again, I go medial, posterior around to lateral, to navicular, fifth med head, and then come back around, okay? That is a great way to do it for the ankle, but we don't always have an ankle that we're testing, so if we do the knee, can I lift over your knee, or do I need someone else? I don't care. Oh, come on over, I'm gonna get there. Then you don't have to. Okay, so if you are doing circumferential, circumferential measurements for the knee, let's say you have somebody who had uh, knee surgery or a knee injury, and they have swelling, 
you are going to be looking at often that person is going to have swelling around the knee and maybe it's going to go down into the ankle a little maybe it's gone up into the thigh a little bit um, chances are they may or may not have it down into the ankle if they do i would do an ankle figure eight and then i would also do the circumferential measurements you can also do this at the elbow you can go elbow and then we're also going to be above and below so again it kind of depends what your patient what kind of swelling they have and what you're interested in capturing Remember, when we do this, we're doing this to look for change. How much change over time, that's a way that we can show insurance that they're improving. Usually when you see a reduction in the swelling, you're also going to see an increase in what? Range of motion. Range of motion. You might even see a decrease in pain. You might see an increase in strength, improvement in gait. So when you start to remove some of that swelling, that's one of those key factors that if you can show insurance that, and the patient, that you are decreasing uh, the swelling, you are making an, a, an opportunity or an environment for that person to be able to move a little bit better, okay? So when we do the knee, again, there are some different landmarks you can use. You are going to write down your landmarks. My favorite landmark is typically at um, the joint line because that's a pretty easy place to mark. So I will actually take a pen and mark the joint line and then you're going to do the exact same thing. So for him, I'm not going to mark it, but I'm going to bring this around so that it is level. Um, I wanna make sure that I'm not twisted anywhere here. We're going to start at one point at the joint line. And I'm going to come around and do the exact same measurement. I like to pull it a little and then make sure that I don't have it too taut. So for him, we have 36.5. So I would mark that. Now, the other place that sometimes is a nice place to do it, though, can change depending on how much flexibility or swelling there is, is sometimes we will do um, mid patella or inferior patella. The only problem with that is that can change. If you have a patient who has swelling and their patella is moved a little bit, or if they have some tightness because of guarding, that patella may not be in the exact same spot next time. So that's why the joint line never changes, right? Once you have your joint line measurement, typically we will go five centimeters to 10 centimeters away from that. So if I go five centimeters down from his joint line, um, I would make a mark there. And then I would also make one at maybe 10. And then if he had swelling that went past that 10 centimeter mark, then I would go down to 15. So I would make a mark at each one of those and I would do the exact same thing. I would take a measurement circumferentially at each one of those marks. So I would basically have a graph in my documentation. I would have a graph for joint line, five centimeters below joint line, 10 centimeters below joint line, 15 centimeters below joint line. When you go above the joint line, I typically start my first one at 10. Only because if you go five centimeters above, you're kind of right in the middle of the patella. So I like to go about 10. Now you're at least superior to the patella. And then I do there 10. And then you can do either 15 or 20. Again, depending on where you're seeing the swelling. And once, if you go high enough, you probably won't see a big change. The only thing you have to be a little careful with when you go superior to the patella, especially if you're seeing someone post-op, um, and I'm going to say the one that I see it the most in is ACL reconstructions. Chances are post-op, what might happen to your quad? Atrophy. Atrophy. So you might actually start with the quad, even though there's swelling, might look equal to the other side because there's been atrophy. Once you start seeing an increase in the muscle girth, then you, your numbers can become um, a little odd, right? Because you might start getting an increase over here. Maybe there's still a little swelling, but now his girth is increasing. So now it looks like, well, his swelling is getting worse and it might not be. So you have to keep that in mind for patients that you see that have atrophy as well. We don't see that as much in the inferior to the patella, but sometimes uh, superior we do, okay? And then you're going to do the same thing. You're going to actually do the other side first. So you're going to measure the uninvolved side and then the involved side. And you're gonna have the exact same measurements for each of those locations for both sides. And that's how you're comparing, okay? All right.
capillary refill, I think we already talked about, pitting edema we talked about. So 